Hi, I'm Carol Arnold. I'm one of your missionaries. Um, I've been very privileged and honored to be part of the family there at Meadowview for many, many years, and I'm very grateful for um, your love and your encouragement, your support, and um, this opportunity to share with you what's been going on in my life. Uh, this has been a challenging year. Um, uh, it started off by me planning a wonderful trip that was going to be going to um, Ethiopia for the first time, returning to Rwanda and Burundi and also Uganda and Kenya and in March. And I had to cancel all of that trip and hopefully it will be, um, we'll be able to reschedule it for the coming year. But in the meantime, I have been uh, spending a lot of time at home. I've been spending a lot of time with family. I've been able to visit my family in Tennessee, uh, in Maryland. Um, I've had family come and visit me, come down from Louisville as well as Baltimore and Tennessee to visit me. I've also been able to go to a wedding in North Carolina. I was able to visit friends and family on a road trip to um, Tennessee and Georgia. And I've also been able to um, do a lot of, of traveling just around Florida, the beaches, trying to stay outside, trying to stay active, uh, visiting lots of friends, being able to walk around the, my lake outside of my house and um, just keep busy. I've been doing a lot of sewing, a lot of reading, watching movies, um, writing letters. Um, I'm also writing my memoirs for my grandchildren and I'm also purging, trying to get rid of things that I have in my house. And if I don't want to get rid of them, I, it's because they have a story. And if that's the case, then I'm writing the story of why I'm keeping it so that my, my children, my grandchildren will know why I still have it. And if it doesn't have a story and if I don't love it and I don't need it and I don't use it, I'm trying to get rid of stuff. And as you know, that's a hard thing to do, especially when you've lived in a in a, a home for over 35 years. Um, my husband was a pastor for over 33 years and when our church sent us on a sabbatical, we went to East Africa where he taught and he had people from 11 different countries there, pastors and wives. And when he returned back to his church here in Orlando, he couldn't get those faces out of his mind. And to make a long story short, he began the ministry and founded Equipping Pastors International where he could take seminary train, uh, seminary training to pastors and wives in countries where they wouldn't have the opportunity to get that kind of teaching. And so EPI began, and I am not a seminarian. I've never been to seminary. I've never been to, I'm not a theologian, but I was, I've been, was married for uh, 37 years at that time. Uh, my husband was 62 and I was 60. And so we, um, he was able to teach theology and I taught on marriage because that's what I knew. I knew how to, what God had taught me about marriage and family. Uh, I, I had failed often in my marriage. I had neglected my husband. I had learned uh, many things about um, what it meant to be a godly biblical wife. And it was those things that I taught. Uh, when my husband died in 2005, uh, I thought for sure maybe that that would be the end of my ministry as well. But the supporters said, Carol, what you're doing is very important. And pastors and wives need to be taught on marriage. Uh, marriages are in trouble all around the world. And we know that marriages are under attack because the enemy knows that if he can destroy a marriage, he can destroy a ministry. And... A marriage is supposed to be a picture to the world of Christ and the church and how much God loves his church and gives himself for his church and how much the church in response loves back. And so it's not surprising that the marriages would want to be destroyed by the enemies of God. And so therefore we need to understand that we're in a battle when we get married and what it means to be in this battle together as a husband and wife that the spouse isn't the enemy. We don't battle flesh and blood, but we battle an enemy that wants to destroy our marriage. And so we shouldn't be surprised that, that we're in a struggle. Um, but if you're in ministry, as the pastors and wives are that, that I teach, then you're under a double attack. And therefore, um, it's even more important that the pastors and the leaders of the church should know what it means to have a godly marriage and how to be a, a biblical wife and a biblical husband 
so that they can in turn teach their people and therefore the churches would be strong and marriages would be strong, families would be strong, churches would be strong. And so that's what I do. And as I said, it's been a challenge this year. I haven't been able to, to go um, and teach the way I want to. Uh, uh, last month I did go to Kenya and I was able to meet with some uh, pastors, but I wasn't able to do conferences. They weren't allowing conferences at that time. But I did set up some conferences for the future that I hope will be able to be done soon. And um, I was also able to visit with some friends while I was in Kenya. Uh, I also did a, 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 a three-hour conference, um, three-day conference for 250 pastors and their wives in Zambia. I had to do um, three hours of videotape teaching, which is not my strong suit. Uh, even this video is hard for me. I'd much rather uh, teach 100 people than to look at a camera and teach. But in this day and age, it's about the only way we can do it. And so I'm grateful to be able to have had that opportunity to teach um, my classes on marriage to those pastors in Zambia. Uh, last week, I was interviewed by Sharon Betters, uh, an old friend of mine who I have worked with in the PCA. Uh, she's written several wonderful books. Her first was um, Treasures of Encouragement. And she and Susan Hunt just recently um, co-authored a book called um, Aging with Grace, Flourishing in an Anti-Aging Culture. And um, there's several women that are featured in the book, and I was one of those women. And so they've asked each of the women if they would be willing to do a 30-minute a, a podcast that will be, I think, aired in January. And so I was able to um, be interviewed with her and work with her in um, doing this podcast which answered quite a few questions about what it does it mean to, to flourish when you're older. And I was featured in the book, and so they did an hour, they're doing an hour long podcast of the women that are featured in the book. I think there's 10 or 11 uh, of us, and, um, and are interviewing us on how, how we're able to flourish in our old age. Um, now, uh, I'm, six, I'm 83 years old, and I'm still able to do quite a bit, but and I realize there is a lot of women my age that cannot go and do the same things I do, but flourishing has to do with bearing fruit. And we know that the fruit of the Spirit doesn't mean going and it doesn't mean doing. The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and contentment and patience and all the things that you can do at any age in any circumstances. And that's what it means to flourish in whatever age you're in. And so I spend a lot of time writing letters, um, trying to meet with people over lunch or taking walks with people to try to encourage them and to do the things that might um, help them as they get older. Some of my dearest friends are, are not, not believers. Um, several of them are Jewish. And I cultivate a relationship with them because I, I appreciate the fact that God called me to be salt and light. And it doesn't necessarily mean doing anything. It just means being who I am and a loving one another, as Jesus said, is the second greatest commandment. Um, one of the things I hope to do in the future, and I'm very excited because I was at church today and I met with four young people that I've been meeting with. They're all college freshmen. Um, 18, 19 years old, three, guys, three young men and one young woman who approached me last spring after I did a missions report asking me if they, they were inspired with, to, on the mission field and asked if they could go with me to do a missions trip. And so this morning we started talking about the possibility of them, the four of them um, going with me the first part of uh, end of December and the first part of January when they can get out of school. One goes to MIT, a couple of them are doing virtual online, and one is a couple of them, of them are also in university. And I can't think of anything that I would rather do than inspire young people to want to go and possibly teach on the mission field. And so I am excited about the possibility of these four young people going with me in January to Kenya, 
uh, taking them to the Kabira slum, taking them to meet some of the pastors, taking them to see um, the people that I've met. And um, I'm going to be starting to raise support for them. And they're going to be starting to raise support for themselves. And they're going to try to be doing some fundraising. I think it's going to cost about $2,000 per kid for everything, which is not much, considering that it'll include transportation there as well as uh, uh, accommodations, food, um, meeting with the people, maybe even a safari. We'll see how that goes. But um, I'm excited about that. And it made me very inspired to think about the fact that these young people heard what I do and heard what I say and really st and still want to go with an old lady to get to, the, uh, to, to, to Africa. So that, I'm very excited about that. Uh, I've talked with a couple of other pastors that we've, we've set up uh, conferences. One is in the first part of November and the other one is in the spring. So I am looking forward to going back and teaching and um, continuing to do those things that God has given me a passion for. Um, when people ask me, Carol, when are you going to retire? I've said, well, it's one of three things has to happen. Um, my body is telling me I can no longer do this. The money is no longer there to enable me to do this. And I don't love it anymore. And so far, none of those things have happened. And so uh, as long as those three things are there, um, I'm going to continue to go and to teach and do whatever I can here in, in the States to inspire other young people as well as older people to do what I'm doing. Um, and hopefully we will see um, God do great and mighty things. And so I'm excited. I'm also, uh, I appreciate so much the, the church and, and what you've done for me. I, I have such great fond memories of being there and you being so kind to me. And I hope that I was disappointed that I couldn't come in March when I was planning to come for your missions conference, but I, I hope that um, I'll be able to come do a road trip soon and be able to come and visit all of you there. Um, you do a wonderful work. Uh, a, a lot of you won't be able to go, and a lot of you won't be able to teach, and a lot of you won't be able to um, even support. But you can all pray, and you can all um, be salt and light, and you can all flourish with the fruit of the Spirit in your own life, wherever you go, and whoever you are with, and whoever God brings into your path, with your family, with your friends, with your neighbors, with your co-workers, uh, all the people that God puts next to you. And I know that together we can flourish as we strive to build the kingdom of God for his glory. So thank you. Appreciate you so much. And God bless you all. Hi, many of you. It's great to be able to talk with you. I'm Scott Brand. For those that you don't know, we'll see Becca later in the video and there will be an appearance by our son, Lewis as well. Uh, in this update to you all about our ministry here in the Republic of Ireland. So we arrived as a family in Ireland last November, the end of November, uh, after a couple years of support raising and about a six month delay, almost exactly six month delay, as we waited for our visas to get approved by the Irish government to come as uh, what they call ministers of religion. And so we arrived here end of November, went through the holiday season with our new church community here, uh, and we were settling into a brand new church plant actually that was starting in a town north of us called Balbriggan. Uh, it's about 20 minutes north of where we're living here in Donabate. There's a church in Donabate that's been around for about nine years and they've decided that they want to become the second youngest Presbyterian church in Ireland and so they've planted 20 minutes north uh, in a town called Balbriggan and they've been doing monthly services and alpha groups if you're familiar with those and building a community there for a couple of years. Our, uh, a friend Josh who we're working with he and his wife Catherine had moved there last year and the plan was at the end of January uh, we would be starting weekly services and services started uh, last week of January and we had about seven weeks of services and then like everyone else across the world uh, about mid-March uh, we were told by the Irish government that we can no longer meet together uh, because everything shut down in Ireland. And so we had a moment of, okay, what's, uh, what's the Lord doing here? Because if you draw up your plans for a church plant, I don't care where you are in the world, uh, 
the plans for a church plant don't involve after seven weeks of meeting not being able to, to gather together. And so we uh, immediately uh, went to figuring out alternatives um, because it was such a young congregation, uh, they were much more willing to try new things. And so we started Zoom Church uh, using our Zoom platform and using YouTube videos and pre-recorded sermons and then having a what we call a big hello afterwards where everybody gets to talk about what things have been like for them that week and then we were also having home groups on Wednesday nights that continued actually longer than they were supposed to because we just decided to keep meeting and through that the Lord was very kind and generous even people that we hadn't seen in the six or seven weeks prior started showing up uh, to these zoom calls and to these home groups and we started being able to build relationships in new ways there as well. Our ministry has changed, uh, but it doesn't feel like we were pretty entrenched in ministry one way and all of a sudden things shifted. We were still very much in the transition period when everybody else started going into transition period as well. And so out of that, we've been able to be a little bit more flexible than we might have been otherwise. After a long season on Zoom of a few months, the government opened things back up again and we were able to, starting the first week of July, start meeting together as a congregation in Balbriggan and as well as Donna Bay. And so we had about nine weeks of meeting together and um, any fears we had about the moving to Zoom church, killing all our momentum as a church, uh, were assuaged in the first couple of weeks as people came back hungry to be together. One of the cool things that has happened in Balbriggan and that has surprised us is that um, it is a very diverse group of people. Now we have uh, so many different nationalities present in our church context. And so we have Eastern and Central and Western Africa represented. We have South Africa represented. We have Eastern and Central Europe and Western Europe as well. We have Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. We have the North of the United States and we have the South of the United States, which is how we're divided. If you don't know, my wife is from Winston-Salem and I am a Yankee. And so we even have cultural differences between us. Uh, and, and in this cultural context of Balbriggan, what has come to the forefront is um, just how beautiful Jesus is in uniting so diverse a community. That what becomes most important is that we're united in Jesus. And so because of that, it's been a very exciting season even though we've been online. Please pray for those relationships as they continue to grow. We're still able to meet one-on-one -on -one with each other uh, and, and go for coffees and walks. And um, Becca can tell you a little bit more about what she's done relationally in the community we have here. Being a mom in the midst of COVID is interesting here in Ireland, just as I'm sure it's very interesting and challenging um, in ways that you didn't imagine in the States as well. I am finding that I'm really enjoying one-on-one -on -one play dates. Um, I've made, little by little, I've been making some friends here in our Donna Bate Church community um, and also just with other moms in our little town of Donna Bate. So um, even in the midst of lockdown when we've only been allowed to meet with one other family, um, I've had a couple like once a week or every other week play dates with one of the women in our church and her little three-year-old boy. So that's been really fun to just get a chance to have a cup of tea with her and chat and our boys play together inside or outside in the rain all bundled up. We've been going for a lot of walks thankfully. There's a farm with this big beautiful um, park and a playground and space to walk around and farm animals to see so we've had a lot of time to go for walks. Um, there's a couple older women in our church that I, that have been pursuing me and so we go for walks and they talk to Lewis and we get to look at the farm, farm animals and talk to each other and share what life has been like in the past few months. So that's been really sweet and I'm slowly pursuing some other young moms, um, some who are believers and some who aren't. and having Newbridge Farm and the playground close by is a really easy, organic way to spend time with other moms. Lewis is doing well. He um, seems to be thriving having mom and dad home and in the house with him and available to play. Um, we take turns throughout the day. Some days I have meetings on Zoom and Scott plays with them and vice versa. Um, but he seems to be doing really well. He decided at about 17 months 
to start walking at the beginning of COVID here. And he loves toddling around um, our house and our garden. And um, yeah, he seems to be doing well. He's very extroverted, more extroverted than I am. So he likes to stand at the window and wave at construction workers who come by in our neighborhood or wave at people whenever we're out and about in the grocery store or at the mall. Even if people are wearing masks, he just likes to talk to people. So he's, he's doing well. I'm really excited for him to get more opportunities to be with other kids. So having a playground where we can interact with other kids and their parents is really great. And that's my prayer is that we can have more frequent play dates for him. Um, but I don't know what that will look like this fall and into the winter if things get tightened up again on the restrictions here in Ireland we'll just have to be creative to find ways for him to still get to be with other children um, a lot of his friends are in their 20s and 30s because there are our surge colleagues or there are friends but I'm little by little he's getting some more two and three year old friends which is great another thing we're trying to navigate right now is with public transportation limited to about 25 percent capacity here uh, and they want that reserved for uh, primary care providers and, and for frontline workers, as they call them here. Um, because of that reality, getting around has been a lot more difficult. We're not in the city where it's easy just to hop on a bus or walk to where we need to go. Uh, Balbriggan is a 20 minute drive. And so even taking a bike is not um, super easy. And whereas a train was easy before, uh, it's mainly filled up with kids going to school on the trains in the morning and, and trying to figure those things out. So because of that, we're exploring getting a second car. So pray for that. Pray the Lord would provide the car that we're supposed to have and the finances to be able to pay for it. Lastly, if you could, uh, this is a line we use within Surge, if you could pray for our praying. Um, it's very easy for me to slip into uh, this crisis has come up and I need to immediately go about addressing and fixing that problem or um, figuring out a way to make things work and uh, my default is self-reliance and so uh, if you could pray that my default would more and more turn to prayer that my default would um, more and more turn to relying on my father who is generous and kind and loves me infinitely more than I could ever imagine and that self-reliance wouldn't rear its ugly head but rather um, I would be reliant on the one who holds all things and I pray for that uh, for both of us as we navigate uh, what seems like a, a season of really high anxiety for a lot of people that um, in our reliance on our father that would also be uh, a light to other people as they learn that self-reliance can only get you so far and only leads to death and so we thank you for praying for us and caring for us as a missions committee, as a church. Uh, for those who have partnered with us financially, we thank you for your continued generosity. For those that continue to pray for us, we thank you for partnering with us in the gospel. Uh, and we look forward to hearing uh, what the Lord does in Meadowview during this time um, of upheaval and, and high anxiety for the world where the church can be shown as a light and a rock and a refuge for those that trust wholly in Jesus' name. Thanks, everybody. Are you singing a song? Goodbye? Can you sing a song? Can you sing a song?
Sit, sit. 